Hey, it is great to be back with all of you. Uh, I love this church. I love being here. I don't know if you know this, but what happens here at this church and through your leaders impacts not just this community, uh, but all around the country and, and around the world. And so from some of those churches and some of those pastors, I just want to say thank you for what God is doing in you here, because what he does in you here, he does through you all around the world. And, and, um, and I'm one of those who has benefited greatly uh, from this church's leadership over the years. Um, I, I'm from Kentucky. Right now I have three teenage girls at home and one son, so I'm not alone. But three teenage girls, if you don't mind praying for me, I'll take those prayers. I'm in over my head. I know I'm in over my head. The nice thing about having three teenage girls is I've learned if you don't like the mood in one room, you just go to the other room. It's like... <laughs> You'll find, you'll find what you're looking for eventually. I, I try to stay on top of things as a dad. You know, I want to know what's happening in the world of teenagers. I try to stay on top of technology and the language that they're using and what words mean. And not long ago, I came across this article uh, that just listed all these new words that have been added to the dictionary in the past year or so, and I was interested in it. A lot of them didn't apply to teenagers. I just, I liked it. I just liked reading new words that have definitions that are unfamiliar to me, and I started playing this game without even planning on it where I would read the new word that's been added to the dictionary, and I'd try to guess what it meant before reading the definition. It's kind of fun. thought you might want to play it. So... Here's the first word for you, new word. The word is phonesia. You want to guess what that means? Just kind of in your own mind, phonesia? It's the combination, of course, of two words, phone and amnesia. So in my thinking, phonesia meant, you know, the leaving your phone somewhere, forgetting where you put it. Here's the actual definition of phonesia. It's the act of dialing a phone number and forgetting who you were calling just as the person answers the phone. <laughs> like, hello? Who is this? You called me. Yeah, it's phonesia. It's, it, it's common enough. There's a word for it. New word, new meaning. Here, here's another new word. You can try and guess the def definition. This is a tough one. It's disconfect is the word. Disconfect. Uh, the hint would be it's something you might use around Halloween time. It's, Applies to candy. Here's, here's the definition of disconfect. It is the attempt to sterilize the piece of candy you dropped on the floor by blowing on it. So <laughs> there's a word for it. You can use this with your kids. You're like, make sure you disconfect that before you eat it. Uh, another new word that I like that might come in handy at the office is, is blame. Blamestorming instead of brainstorming. It's <laughs> sitting in a group and discussing who's responsible for the company's problems rather than trying to solve them. It's blamestorming. It's Happens enough, there's a word for it. And then another word that seems applicable, especially as we get ready for tax season here, and, and the word is intoxication. Intoxication, here's the definition. It's the euphoria from getting a tax refund, which lasts until you realize it was your money to begin with. So that's <laughs> it's a common enough phenomenon that now we have a word and a definition. So anyway, I was reading this article and I just was intrigued. I like new words with new meanings. I started thinking, though, about familiar words with familiar definitions that we kind of use casually. They don't really get our attention. Um, we've heard those words so often, we don't pay much attention to them. And it's one of those words that I, I want to talk to you for a few minutes about today. And, and the word is grace. It's easy just to assume that we understand grace because it's a word that gets thrown around a lot, especially in church circles. If you've been in church for much of your life, you've heard about grace. There's a lot of content in Scripture committed to explaining grace. In fact, the Apostle Paul, who wrote much of the New Testament, wrote all these letters to new churches, uses the word grace more than 100 times as he explains the concept to new believers, to first-generation Christians. One of my favorite definitions or explanations of grace is in Ephesians 1, verse 7 and 8. Paul explains grace this way, For the blood, it is for the, by the blood of Christ you are set free. It's, it's the blood of Jesus that gives us grace. It's not that you earned it. It's not that your religious rule-keeping has 
caused you to deserve it, it is by the blood of Jesus. It's the price that he paid on the cross for us where he took his punishment upon, or our punishment upon himself. And Paul explains, it's by the blood of Christ you were set free. That is, our sins are forgiven. How great is the grace of God which he has lavished upon us, which he has given us in such large measure. And that explanation is, is helpful, right? But here's what I've learned about the word grace is that if you wanna understand grace, you need more than a definition. You need more than an explanation. What you need is an experience. Until you've experienced grace, you don't really understand grace. To that end, grace is a little bit like romantic love. Or you can open up a dictionary and you can read a definition of romantic love and, and that might be helpful. I mean, you, you could talk to a, a scientist and a scientist could perhaps tell you the neural and chemical responses in the brain when somebody feels romantic love, and that explanation might be helpful, but, but if you really want to understand romantic love, ah, you fall in love. And you don't understand it until you experience it. And the same is true of grace. Like when I ask for a definition of grace from you, what I'm not looking for is, is, a, is an explanation where you quote some scriptures Although that's the foundation and that explanation is necessary, but what I'm not looking for is like this kind of creative um, acronym for the word grace that spells it out. What I'm looking for is a story, is an experience. That's how you know you know grace, is you've, you've felt it, you've experienced it in your own life. And so as I studied the theme of grace in scripture, what I found is that more often than not, grace is something that is taught to us through stories, through narratives. There's this rule in hermeneutics, the interpretation of scripture, there's a rule that says you don't just pay attention to what is said, but you pay attention to how it's said. That the genre matters, the genre tells you something. And, and throughout scripture, the genre of grace is story. Where it doesn't necessarily get explained, but it gets conveyed through one story after another. So if you read through the Gospels, do this sometime, read through the Gospels and you'll find that Jesus never uses the word grace. So Paul used it more than 100 times. Jesus never used it. And yet, did he teach us about grace? Yeah. John says that Jesus was full of grace, full of grace and truth, and, and so it just spilt out on everyone who was around him. And so one story after another in the ministry and in the life of Jesus, it teaches us about grace. And there's something that happens as we read those stories where we long for it to be our story as well. And so you have Jesus beginning his ministry and he calls the disciples to follow him. This was a, a normal, normal practice for a rabbi. They would uh, call disciples. The way that they would get disciples in those days is that it would be a, an application process. So a rabbi would accept applications and then they would go through the applications and, and they would pick the best and the brightest, the people who were at the top. And if their credit was approved and if their references checked out, then, then they could be a disciple of that rabbi. But here's what's really interesting about Jesus. He doesn't, he doesn't accept applications, he offers invitations. This is huge in what it teaches us about grace. So he, he doesn't accept applications, he offers invitations and he invites people that never would have made the cut had they been applying. And so he invites a few fishermen. And Matthew tells us about Jesus coming to his tax collector's booth and a tax collector socially in those days was um, below a prostitute. And Jesus comes to Matthew, the tax collector, and he says, follow me and be my disciple. And, and the crowd would have thought Jesus was being sarcastic or maybe trying to be funny, and, and he wasn't. He was calling Matthew, Matthew because of his name. I mean, we know he had most likely flunked out of rabbinical school. His parents had hopes for him of being a rabbi. He didn't make it. He ended up on the other end of the spectrum, the exact opposite. He's a, a tax collector and Jesus comes to Matthew and says, follow me. And in that story, we learn something about grace, that no matter what you've done, no matter what you've become, no matter what people have said about you or thought about you, you still get the invitation that grace hasn't given up on you and grace can still rewrite your story and there's something that the story captures that an explanation can't. One of my favorite stories in scripture, 
is the story in Luke 5 where Jesus heals a leper. And in those days, if, if you were diagnosed with leprosy, it was, it was, as much as anything, it was a life sentence of never being touched again. It had no hugs and no handshakes, no pats on the back, no kiss on the cheek, no one to wipe away a tear from your eye, never being touched again. That's what it meant to have leprosy in those days. So you're unclean, could not be touched. And yet here's what Luke tells us in verse 13 of chapter 5. It says, before Jesus healed the man with leprosy, before he healed him, he reached out and touched him. He didn't have to do that. He could have stood at a safe distance and healed him. He could have healed him and then touched him, but he touched him before he healed him. And there's something about grace that gets conveyed here. You see, the miracle reveals the power of Jesus, but the touch reveals the grace of Jesus. Jesus doesn't say, you you need to get your life cleaned up first, and when when you're no longer afflicted with this, then, then I'll touch you. But Jesus touches the leper right where he's at. And this is huge because I, I hear this all the time from people in church where I, I, I'm going to come back to church. I'm going to turn back to God. I, I, need to get, I need to get this area of my life in order first. I need to get some control over this struggle, this addiction. When, when this relationship is right, when I, when I get this cleaned up, then, then I'm going to come back to God. But I need to get this fixed first. That's not That's not what grace does. Grace touches you and then heals you. You don't have to get clean. You don't have to get washed up. You come just as you are. Grace meets you right there. Another example is in John chapter 8. Jesus is teaching early in the morning, and this group of religious leaders comes into the courtyard. They throw this woman into the dirt at the feet of Jesus, covered in a bed sheet, one of the accusers kind of lays out the accusation and and says to Jesus, we found this woman in bed with another man. Literally, she was caught in the act of adultery. The law says we stone her, what do you say? She's caught in the act. And they've got their rocks in hand ready to stone her. Then Jesus looks at her and he he knows her. He's known her since... She was in her mother's womb. He knows her name. He knows the number of hairs on her head. And and Jesus says to her accusers, if any of you is without sin, you can cast the first stone. And I don't know how. Somehow they know that he knows. Right? Like somehow they know he knows what they didn't think anybody else knew. And so they stop start dropping the rocks and Jesus is left alone with this woman in a very tender, grace-filled moment where he says to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and leave your life of sin. And there's something in that story that teaches us what an explanation never could. Now you take the same amount of real estate in scripture and you just commit that to an explanation about grace and I don't know that you would understand it as completely as you do in just reading that story. And as you hear that story, there's something, if you're like me, there's something within you that says, well, maybe if it's true for her, it's true for me. And this is just true throughout the life of Jesus. He never used the word grace, but he's constantly teaching us about grace up to the point where he's on the cross and and soldiers have, have nailed him to a tree. And all of heaven's armies are kind of watching this unfold and they're just waiting. Jesus, you just say the word. And we will put an end to this. And Jesus is on the cross. He clears his throat. He has something to say. All of heaven grows silent, waiting for the command. And Jesus says, Father, forgive them. And he teaches us about grace. And so when I ask you to define a word like grace, what I'm asking for is a story of how God's grace has been great in your life. There are a few phrases I hear people say that I think keep them from experiencing grace in their own story. And here's one phrase that I hear people say sometimes, something along these lines of um, not after what I've done, not after what I've done. And so they look back on their life and there's this moment that they can't undo. There's this season that they look back on and, and 
though they may understand grace, though they might be able to explain grace to others, it doesn't seem like it applies to them because of this. And so after a service, a woman comes up to me and, and she kind of confesses a secret that she's kept. She's embezzled thousands of dollars to fund her alcohol addiction and nobody knows about it. And she doesn't think God would wanna have anything to do with her. And she feels like she shouldn't even be in church almost apologetic about her presence. And it's not that she needs to have grace explained to her, it's that she really needs to experience it. But in her mind, not after what, what I've done. Or a man confesses that in his first, he's been married about 10 years, in his first year of marriage, he was on a business trip and he was unfaithful to his wife and not, she doesn't know about it, he's never told anybody, and not long after that happened, he, he stopped going to church, he doesn't remember the last time he prayed because again, God wouldn't want to have anything to do with him, not after what he's done, that's how he thinks, and so, he might understand grace, but he hasn't experienced it because it just feels like it's too much for or there's not enough based on what he's done. And so, so here's what happens. As we start to study grace in scripture and we read these stories, we become aware that no matter what I've done, grace is great enough. But it's not just the stories in scripture, it's our own stories that allows grace to spread. When you and I are willing to share some ways that grace has been great, other people start to think, okay, well maybe that's me too. Maybe that can be for me as well. It was a Thursday night and I was lying in bed next to my wife and she had fallen asleep and I, I, I was awake staring at the ceiling thinking about my sermon for the upcoming weekend. I was gonna be preaching on dealing with regrets and it can be difficult. We have done something that cannot be undone and so how do we deal with regrets? As I laid there, I suddenly heard a, a crash come from our bathroom, and I got up, and I went into the bathroom, and I saw where this full-length mirror that had been hanging on the door of our bathroom um, had fallen off the door, and it hit the tile floor, and had shattered into pieces. And when the mirror fell, it exposed something that represented a very significant regret in my life. Behind that mirror, there was a hole in the door. How did it get there, you may ask. <laughs> and one night years ago, I say years ago like it was a long time. I've only lived in the house four years, so I'm not that long ago. But one night years ago, I got angry and I lost my temper and I punched a hole in, in the closet door. That is embarrassing. Um, because it, it's just not at all who I want to be, you know? And I, I really wish I could go back and be a, a patient and gentle husband and father. I, I want to be a man of humility and self-control. But sometimes I, I'm not. And that whole kind of represented the reality of that in my life. And after it happened, I, I hoped my wife would forget about it and my kids wouldn't find out about it and... And so I dealt with my regret the way a lot of us do is, is I, uh, I covered it up. Like for me though, I like literally covered it up. I, I went to the hardware store and I got a long mirror and I covered that hole in the door with this, this long mirror and I just pretended like it didn't happen. And as I stood there after it had broken on the floor, I stood there and I looked at the hole in the door and I looked at the broken pieces of mirror on the floor and I could, I could see my reflection in the broken pieces and it was, it was hard, you know, it was hard to miss the metaphor. I was feeling pretty broken myself in that moment and I, I got on my knees, I started picking up this broken glass and my wife heard the the noise and she, she came into the closet, she found me on my knees picking up this glass and she saw the tears in my eyes and I, I thought in that moment, I, I, had re I realized that I never really apologized to her or to God, I'd not really repented of that sin, I just covered it up and, and tried to pretend like it, it hadn't happened and, and I confessed to both of them, I'm sorry. My wife came over, and she, put her, she put my head up against her stomach and she just kind of ran my, her fingers through my hair and uh, didn't say anything but I, I felt grace. And 
and we started cleaning up those broken pieces together. And the next morning, I, it was Friday now, and I, I was getting ready to preach on Saturday. And I, I told her, I said, you know, I'm supposed to preach about dealing with regrets. And, and I feel like maybe I'm supposed to share this story because it feels a little bit like God flicked the mirror off the door. And if I didn't tell the story, it was going to get worse before it got better. So I felt like I, I need to be honest. I, I don't, I don't want to be a hypocrite up there talking about how we cover up. Some of you cover up your sin. Well, yeah, I, I didn't, felt like I had to just tell the story, but I didn't want to. I was hoping she'd, I was hoping she'd say no, right? Because like, uh, I knew it would be embarrassing for her if I got up and shared that story. I needed to ask for her permission. I was hoping she'd say no, and I'd be like, well, God, yeah, what do you want me to do? I, I, it's not that I'm not willing, but I want to honor my wife. <laughs> feel like I should put her needs out of my own. And, you know, but she didn't say no. She said, well, I, I feel like, it, you know, she said, if you feel like that's what God wants you to do, then you should. And I, I told her the truth. I said, I'm, I'm just afraid of, I'm afraid of what people think of me. And she said with a little laugh, she said, you trust me, we're not the only ones with a hole in our door or a hole in our wall. So that weekend I stood up in church and I, I told them the story of their preacher losing his temper and punching a hole in the door. And when the first service was over, I, I saw one of our church leaders walking over to me. And uh, I just kind of instinctively looked down, you know, feeling embarrassed and I didn't know what he was gonna say. He walked over to me and he, he gave me a hug. He's not, had not typically been a hug hugger, right? I mean, there's people who hug and there are people who don't and he didn't he's always a fist bump guy and and so now he's giving me a hug and he just says loud enough just just above a whisper he says to me as he's giving me a hug he said there he said I've never told no one knows this he said but there's a hole behind a picture in my bedroom <laughs> and I uh, talked to him for a few minutes and his eyes were welled up with tears and then after we finished talking I, I noticed that a line had formed. <laughs> and there were no women in this line. Just a bunch of men. And we all had one thing in common. We had a hole in our door or in our wall or one guy in his dashboard, which is a little more impressive. <laughs> and when my wife had told me, hey, we're not the only ones with a hole in the door, I thought she meant that metaphorically. Like, you know, we all have our hole in the door moments. We all have this moment we regret. But no, li like literally, I think I got up to over 30 guys who had shared this story with me. And most of them began it with, no one knows this. Or, I, you know, I tried to cover this up or I tried to hide this. And... But what I found and stumbled onto is that even though I didn't want to do it, when I was willing to kind of share about how God's grace had been great towards me, then other people heard that, and they want that to be their story too. And I could have, in that sermon, I could have talked about how do you deal with regret, regrets, and I could have given a lengthy explanation about grace, and, and, and people could have understood some things maybe a little differently, or, but when I told the story, then other people wanted to tell a story. And that's what God wants to happen. He wants this to be a safe place where you can be vulnerable, where you can just say, yeah, you know, God's great, his grace has been great in my life. I'm a trophy of grace. It's, it, it's story's not so much about what I did wrong, it's what God has done for me, the grace, the forgiveness that I didn't deserve, he's given in such large measure. A another phrase that I, I hear people sometimes say that I think keeps us from experiencing the greatness of grace in our stories is, is this phrase, not after what's been done to me. Not after what's been done to me. In other words, I like the idea of God's grace for me, no matter what I've done, but God's grace through me, that's, I, it's not great enough. Not after what's been done to me. And so instead of dealing with guilt and shame, it, it's dealing with this bitterness and anger. And we've just been hurt too deeply. We've been betrayed too significantly. The pain is too much and God's grace doesn't seem to be great enough. It, it, it might have seemed that way before. What happened to you happened to you. But now it just, it just seems like that, that there's just not enough grace there. And so you, you live with this bitterness and anger. You don't want to. But you, you have become an angry person. And little things bother you and set you off. It's not who you want to be, but that's how anger works. It just spills over. And... You don't want to let it go. 
You don't want to release it because if you do, it feels like you're letting that person get away with it. And they owe you something. I get it. They, they owe you money or they owe you, they owe you a marriage. They owe you a childhood. They owe you, at the very least, an explanation. And if you just let it go, it's like they got away with it. And, and yet, Paul tells us in Ephesians 4 to get rid of bitterness, anger, rage, resentment. He says, if you don't do that, if you hold on to it, it grieves the Holy Spirit, he says. Because the Holy Spirit is trying to grow the fruit of the Spirit in our hearts and in our lives. And love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. The, the Spirit is trying to grow these fruits in our hearts. But this bitterness and anger is just choking it out. And, and Paul says, if, if you don't get rid of those things, then it, it gives the devil a foothold. It gives him a staging ground. It gives him a base camp where... He can reach into these other areas of our life. He says, you gotta get rid of it. And it's not that we don't want to, but it doesn't seem fair if we do. And so we have this DVR in our minds and different things trigger it, but when it gets triggered, we just play, push play, and remember the offense that was committed against us. And, and we don't wanna let go of that because we don't want the person to get away with it. And just for me to get up and say, hey, you gotta let that go, feels offensive because in our minds we think letting it go means that we're letting it into thin go into thin air just some magical moment where it's like that doesn't bother me anymore that's not how it works instead what we're saying is it's so significant i can't carry this weight anymore it hurts so deeply i can't go on like this it's been too many years and that weight has become too heavy and it's affecting too many people I gotta let God, I gotta let God deal with this because I, I can't. A few years ago, I, um, I had this, there's this influential, fairly influential blogger who decided that he didn't care very much for me or my writing and he wanted to make sure that everybody knew how he felt. And I had never met this man. He never tried to contact me to express his opinions. He never attempted to reach out to me as a brother in Christ to express his concerns. And he, he seemed to have something against me personal. personally. His, his re review of me was pretty harsh and kind of surprisingly hostile. And I thought he took things out of context and made sweeping assumptions and turned those into unfair accusations. And Not that any of it bothered me, but I'm just saying. <laughs> and... And I know that that's this kind of part of life on the internet these days. And, and usually I'm okay with those things, but if I were being honest, I'd, I'd just, my mom would just tell you that I, you know, I kind of wanted this guy to like me. And he didn't. And it was hurtful and it was, it was embarrassing too. And my dad would tell me, like, son, the secret in these situations, the secret is to have tough skin and a soft heart. But I don't know how you, like, make it that way my dad would also say son the dogs bark but the caravan keeps moving and I don't know what that means but <laughs> I like the idea you just you keep going and you just don't let those things get to you but then at night you know even if you don't want to sometimes you just remember some of those hurtful words and so a few nights after this guy's blog came out, I, I was up late at night feeling some angst over it, and I, I wrote a response to his comments that I was going to post on his blog. But when I finished writing the response, before I posted, I read it, and I'm like, yeah, I, I just, I sound defensive and insecure. It's because I am, but I didn't want to sound that way, and so I thought, I'm not going to, I'm not going to put that out there. And, and then I thought, I'll just send him a personal email. So I write this email, start writing this email to him. And at some point, I start feeling like the kid on the playground who says to the bully, why don't you like me? And I don't want to be that kid. I don't want to be that kid. So I, I'm not, I decided not to do that. And I should have been in bed sleeping, but I was just sitting there feeling a little bit hurt and a little bit bitter. And then this, this new email popped up in my inbox, and it was from someone that I, I respected greatly. And the subject line of this email just said, Kyle, I defended you. And I opened up the email, and the person said, I never respond to my critics, but I do speak up for those I love. And then he went on to tell me what he had posted on this guy's blog who had been ripping me. And, and here's, here's what my defender had put on this guy's blog. He said, it's sad you feel compelled to pick apart Kyle's message and find some stylistic fault or note that something was left out. Book reviews reveal more about the 
about the reviewer's bias or ego than the quality of the book. So now I've given you and your commenters a gift. You can all write about why I'm wrong, and your group will love that. And that's fine with me. I'd rather have you aim your darts at me since God grants me more grace and power every time I sincerely pray for God to bless you. May God and hopefully others continue to show you far greater grace than you offer to those who are not in your group. Signed, Rick Warren. (laughs) And you know what I did after reading that? I wiped away a few tears, set my laptop, got in bed, kind of had the Eye of the Tiger theme song going on in my head, (laughs) but I just went to sleep. I just went to sleep. I didn't need to hang on to it anymore. I I didn't need to keep thinking about what I was going to say and what I was going to do and how I was going to respond. Somebody else took care of that for me. The bully on the playground had met his match. I could just go to sleep. It was fine. And, and there's this moment where as a follower of Jesus where you just say, God, you, you know what I can't and you see what I don't. And, and so I'm, I'm just gonna let you take care of this. I, mean, I know in my mind what I think should happen, but, but you're big enough. And you've been so gracious to me that I'm gonna go ahead and pray for grace towards these people who've hurt me. I, I, I don't have it necessarily to give myself, but God, we, I'll pray for you to give it, and you just, you just let, you let God handle that. And when that DVR begins to play, that, what happened to you, you start pushing stop, and you start playing what God did for you. And if you can replace what happened to you with what God has done for you, then you start to find that you've got more grace to give than maybe you thought. Because what God has done for you is greater than anything you will ever be asked to give to others. One other phrase I sometimes hear people say that keeps them from experiencing the greatness of grace in their own story is this phrase, not after what my life has become. In other words, it's, just, it's too late. You know, things are too messy and things are too broken and things are too complicated. And I like this for other people and I'm glad you're giving this message and it would have been helpful to hear years ago, but the reality of my situation is it's busted. And, and I just don't know how grace can get me out of this. I don't know how grace can redeem this, whatever life has thrown at you. So one more story, this one's one of my favorites. I received a message on Facebook, a private message in 2009 from a man named Wes, who at the time was in his early 40s and he lived in Virginia. I'd never met him, and here's what he wrote. He said, Kyle, I don't know if you have any good Facebook stories, but I think you might after you read this. I'm not exactly sure why, but I feel compelled by God to tell you this story. He said, I have known I was adopted all my life. I was raised in a Christian home by two terrific people who could not have children of their own. Wes says, I'm now happily married and I have my own children whom I dearly love. I never had a desire to seek out my birth parents until a few years ago. Wes says, I was attending a Christian retreat and one of the speakers was an older man who told about getting his girlfriend pregnant and then secretly giving the child up for adoption. And in his story that he gave at the retreat, he explained that he had lived with constant guilt that eventually caused him to develop a hard heart and a bitterness towards God, but he said that one day, the daughter he had given up for adoption contacted him and told him that she forgave him and God forgave him too. And the speaker at this retreat explained that this changed his life and that he found this freedom and healing and it brought him back to God. And Wes says, that story from that man made me think of my own situation of being given up for adoption, and I wondered if it would help my birth parents to know that I was doing okay. I was able to find the name of my birth father, and I contacted him, and it became clear to me that I was right about the guilt and the pain that could follow a person after making such a difficult decision. He had never told anyone about my birth. It seemed that it was probably best that I not interfere with his life or complicate things for him. But then something happened. Recently, my family changed cable providers, and one night, he says, I was lying in bed with my wife, and Kyle, one of your shows came on. I was already half asleep. It's fine. I mean, I don't take that personally, but 
just telling me what happened. And I, I, was all, I was already half asleep, but my wife was watching the show, and suddenly I was startled when my wife exclaimed, oh my gosh, I think that's your cousin. And she was talking about you, Kyle. She knew a lot more about my birth family than I did because she's the one who did all the research, and I didn't believe her. But after a little Google search, I realized she was correct. And I hope you're not too shocked, but your uncle, David Eidelman, is my birth father. I picked you to contact first because as a pastor, I thought you might be used to dealing with difficult situations like this. <laughs> I know that I also have a sister. It's my cousin Sarah. But I don't know if she knows about me, and she didn't. I don't want to stir the family pot or create problems or difficult situations, but like I said, I feel like God compelled me to reach out. And when I read that Facebook message, immediately a lot of things started to make sense to me with my uncle. I'd grown up living in close proximity to him, but we weren't necessarily close. And he taught me how to water ski and gave me some karate lessons as a kid, but I, I just remembered him not necessarily being very, very happy. And I, I remembered many, many times over the years praying for him as a family, but he just didn't have much interest in, in spiritual things. In, in hindsight, I, I can see that he was a man who carried a heavy burden and a heavy weight. I think keeping a secret like that for so long, the longer you keep it, the heavier it can feel. And he had never told anyone, and he had been through some broken marriages, and just had, I'd always kept that to himself. But when the secret came out about his son, he, he, it was fairly traumatic and overwhelming for him, really. I mean, you keep a secret like that for so long, what are, what are people going to think? What are his parents? What are my grandparents? What would they think? What about his siblings? My dad, boy, what, what, he never knew. What about his daughter who wanted a sibling? What was she going to say? And so it was just very overwhelming. But over the next few months, my uncle Dave and his son Wes began to talk more regularly, and eventually they decided they wanted to meet. And Wes lived in Virginia, and my uncle lived in Missouri, so they decided to meet at my house in Kentucky. And we decided to turn it into a little family reunion, and we invited a lot of people, aunts and uncles and cousins from all over. My grandparents were there. And we were all there when Wes pulled up in his minivan with his wife and kids. And he got out with his beautiful family and starts walking to the house. And I watch as my uncle walks towards his son for the first time. And I watch as the two of them embrace. And we're all just kind of wiping away tears. I was too far away to hear the words that were exchanged, but Wes gave my uncle a gift. I didn't know what the gift was. I found out later it was a watch, but, but it triggered a, a really strong emotion in my uncle. I, I'm not used to seeing that in him. I would not seen him cry before. I, but this gift just triggered this very strong emotional response from my uncle, and I didn't understand why the watch would... I mean, obviously it was an emotional moment, but there was something about the, the gift. And then later my dad brought the watch over, and he showed it to me, and I looked at it, and it looked like a nice watch, but my dad said, turn it over. Turn it over. And two words were engraved on the back. Pure grace. And I'm telling you, just like that, 40 years of shame and guilt and bitterness and anger and resentment just melted off of him. And he, he has become a different person. He... He's turned back to God. He's gotten connected and plugged into a local church. He and the pastor have actually become good friends. I was, I was talking to him not long after that on the phone. And he ended a phone conversation by telling me, I love you. And I about fell on the floor. I, I'd, never, I'd never heard him say anything like that to me before. And what maybe surprises me the most is that I'm getting to tell you the story. Think, just think about that. He kept the secret for 40 plus years, never told anyone about it. And now I'm telling thousands of people about it. I, I asked permission. I'm like, hey, do, do you mind me? You know that secret, that one secret that you kept <laughs> from all of us for four decades? Do you remember that one? How, are you okay with me just getting on stage and telling that to as many people as are listening? I didn't, I mean, I, I didn't, I emailed that. I didn't ask him that. There's some things you don't, like, you email those things, right? So I, <laughs> I asked him on email, I said, is this okay with you? Here's what he said to me, listen. Here's what he said, his response. Email me back, please feel free. 
please feel free to share my situation in any way that will express God's love, mercy, and amazing grace to anyone who needs it. And maybe you do. Maybe you need your own story. And I, I've taken seminary classes on systematic theology and studied grace, and I've read numerous theological and doctrinal books about the subject of grace, and I've listened to all kinds of sermons on grace. But, but that email, and I understood it differently. And so I just want to be real clear that grace needs to be a part of your story. And if you, if you can't define grace by telling me a story, then you don't know grace. And grace is greater. And it's greater than what you've done. It's greater than what's been done to you. It's greater than whatever you're going through. And grace is greater than the diagnosis you were given, and it's greater than the abuse that you experienced, and it's greater than the secrets that you've kept, and it's greater than the addiction that you've battled. And listen, grace may not heal your husband, but grace will hold you up. And grace may not cure your cancer, but grace will carry you through. And grace may not rescue you from your circumstances, but grace will redeem your circumstances. And no matter how far you've fallen, no matter how often you've failed, grace is greater. No matter how many times you've relapsed or how often your resolve has collapsed, grace is, is greater. And you may say to yourself, well, yeah, but not, it's not for me, not after what I've done, not after what's been done to me. But grace is greater than whatever you've done, not because of anything you'll do, but because of what Jesus has done for you. And so the most important thing about my story and about your story is, is this. It's that grace is greater. The most important thing about your story is, is not that you cheated. The most important thing about your story is not that you were cheated on. It's not that you dropped out or got kicked out or were locked up or slept around. The most important thing about your story is not that you were addicted or that you got convicted. The most important thing about you and the most important thing about me is that the greatness of God's grace is real and it's true, and it's for you, and no matter how broken things may be, that because of Jesus, God can make all things new. So grace is powerful enough to erase your guilt, and grace is big enough to cover your shame, and grace is real enough to heal your relationships, and grace is strong enough to hold you up when you're weak, and grace is sweet enough to cure your bitterness, and it's satisfying enough to deal with your disappointments, and grace is beautiful enough to redeem your brokenness, and you may have given up on grace. Hey, grace is not given up on you. It is no accident that I showed up to speak this weekend and that you happen to be sitting here. And it's not by chance that you're listening to this. It is God's grace at work in your life right now. His grace is chasing you down. And his grace will help you up. So no matter what, no matter what your story has been and no matter what you've done or what's been done to you, no matter what your life has become, then the story of your life can still be grace is greater. Let's pray. God, I, I just pray that, um, that we would not just be able to explain a word like grace, but that, that we, could, we could tell a story, that we'd be able to experience it. And I, I know that there's some people who came in here today, and, and you just don't want them to leave the same way they walked in. And they're carrying a heavy weight. Maybe it, it's the, the guilt and the shame, or maybe it's the bitterness and the anger, but God, they, you want to give them your grace. You want to lavish your grace upon them, not because they've earned it or not because they deserve it, because Jesus, you, you paid the price. Because, Jesus, you, you gave your life so that we could receive this gift. And so, God, would you let this church be a place where stories are told of your great grace and where others can come and know it's a safe place to experience it for themselves. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for checking out this week's message on YouTube. We would love to get you connected with our online community. There's three easy ways to get you involved. First, learn about belonging to our church family by taking Class 101 online. Second, you can join an online small group or a local home group in your area. And third, check out our Facebook group to engage with our online community throughout the week. 
To take these next steps, visit saddleback.com slash online or shoot me an email at online at saddleback.com. I hope to hear from you soon.